Okay, so thank you to all of you for waiting at the waiting at the waiting room. And welcome to this second design webinar that is organized by the International Dairy Federation. Um, this event is part of the IUBM project called Disarm. And the webinar, as you can see, will be entitled Management of Calves from Birth to Winning. Um, just going to the second slide, I'll tell you that Disarm is an active network. It's uh, dedicated to finding innovative solutions for antibiotic resistance. And the project aims to reduce antibiotic resistance by reducing the needs for antibiotics in livestock farming by focusing on disease prevention and prudent use of antibiotics. So please, if you, if you want to know more about the project, check the design website. There's quite some materials prepared by the members of the project, which are in the next slide, and they cover all the livestock species. Um, today, we have with us four renowned professionals. Uh, they're working on, on calf management. Each of them will provide a short presentation, and you can ask questions using the chat box the, uh, on Zoom. And also please remain muted and with the video off. And with this, I will just introduce you our chair of today is Dr. Kerstin Barth. Is from the, she's from the University of, uh, from the German Tunin Institute of Organic Farming. And she's also leading the work on uh, health management at IDF. Uh, Kerstin, the floor is yours. So very well, uh, warm welcome from me as well. Um, it's nice to have you here today. Um, as uh, Maria already told you about the DISARM project, I will just short, give you a short introduction in the uh, work of the action team, um, managing calves from uh, birth to weaning. This is an action team that's funded uh, last year in or the beginning of this year. And uh, we had already one webinar and it, this webinar focused on the cow-calf contact systems. And this one is the second one for us. And as one of the tasks of the action team is to showcase best practices and also common practices of calf rearing in under different and very various conditions. I'm very happy that today we can see how calves are reared on in three different, very different countries from uh, three different continents. So uh, I think I will just start with the, with the first presentation and introduce our first speaker. And this is Jennifer van Os, and she is an assistant professor and uh, extension specialist at the University of Wisconsin. And Jennifer worked with renowned scientists at the University of California and Davis and also at the University of British Columbia. And as I know, she's very active in the International Society of Applied Ethology. And one of uh, the goal of her extension program, as I wrote it, uh, as I read it, is to promote best practices in management and housing. And today, Jennifer will talk about single and group housing in calves, and I'm looking forward to her presentation. And just to mention, as Maria already said, if you have any comments or any questions, please type them in the in the chat box. We will have at the end of the presentations enough time to discuss the questions as well. So enjoy the first presentation. Thank you so much for the introduction and for having me. And if at any time you have trouble hearing me, please do speak up. So thanks again. So here's the outline for my brief presentation today. I want to start just by giving a bit of context about the US dairy industry and pre weaned calf rearing practices in general. And then I want to just discuss a few health and welfare considerations for additional context. And then I will go over various housing practices, which is what I was asked to focus on. And then I'm also going to describe some milk feeding practices that I think have some important health and welfare implications. So this is a heat map of dairy farms in the United States by state. And so the darker regions represent a greater density of dairy farms. So the states with the darkest colors have 2000 or more dairy farms. So Wisconsin has uh, currently approximately 7000 dairy farms, for example. 
And I just want to show you this distribution so that you can see where most farms are located. All of this does not show where most cows or calves are actually located. And some of the data that I'll be presenting today was taken from a report published by the United States Department of Agriculture or USDA in 2016, but the data were collected in 2013 and 2014. So periodically, the USDA puts out these reports to describe current management practices. And you can see that they sampled dairy farms from 17 out of 50 states. So they selected states that they consider major dairy producing but you can see it's not completely representative of all the states in the US that have farms, which is that inset in the lower right. In addition to presenting the USDA data, we also collected data in a survey last fall. So in late 2016, uh, 2019, myself and colleagues distributed an online survey. And so we were able to capture responses from dairy producers and calf raisers in 30 out of 50 states in the US. And so this actually includes some states that weren't in the USDA sample. And so if you compare this to the heat map of dairy farms on the lower right, you can see that we did have a higher concentration of responses in certain states near Wisconsin in the upper Midwest, as well as the Northeast of the United States. And one of the striking things that it was seen in our sample was the great variation in herd sizes. And what we found was that some dairy farms raise their own heifers, but then there are also farms who specialize in raising heifer calves. So we sometimes call these calf ranches or custom growers. And so they don't milk any cows, they only raise calves. So out of the dairy farms, the mean number of pre-wean heifers on the day of the response was 187 calves, but the range was one calf to 24,000. And for the farm specializing in calf raising, the mean was over 4,500 calves with a range from again, just one heifer to over 81,000 heifer calves on the day of the survey. So what this is meant to convey is that there really is no one typical farm type. Dairy farming and calf raising in the US is very diverse and they're diverse in the size of their herds, the types of facilities and their management practices. One thing I would like to note also is, as you could see in the previous map, not all farms raise their own heifers. So most heifers are raised on the farm where they're born. So across the US, 92% of farms, according to the USDA, raise at least some of their own heifer replacements on site. And if we're looking at all heifers being raised on site, that's approximately two thirds of farms. So then if we're looking at it by number of heifer calves instead of by number of farms, nearly three quarters of heifer calves are raised on the farm where they're born. If we're looking only at large farms, which were considered those with over 500 milking cows, approximately half of those large farms outsource their heifer rearing. So the calves are born on the farm, but then they're sent to these custom growers. And for these larger farms, the majority of these operations send their calves to the custom growers before weaning. So on average, when calves are only seven days old, they're put on a truck and sent to these custom growing operations. So in contrast with the small and medium sized farms, which we would consider under 500 milking cows, the majority of heifers who are sent for custom growing are not sent off until they're already weaned. So some of these smaller operations are also outsourcing their heifer raising, but it's post weaning. And most commonly in either of these situations, the heifers return to the dairy farm once they're pregnant. And so I'm just providing this for context. And for the sake of this presentation, I will not distinguish between heifer calves raised on dairy farms and those raised by custom growers. So next, I just want to provide a little bit of context about some health and welfare considerations in the US. So traditionally within the US dairy industry and among dairy scientists and animal scientists, there's been a great emphasis on promoting calf health, growth and productivity rather than other aspects of welfare. So of course there are many frameworks for studying and discussing animal welfare science. And I'm showing Dr. David Fraser's three spheres here. And our emphasis in the US has traditionally been on aspects of biological functioning and health. And so primarily because of this emphasis on health, over half of US farms and the vast majority of heifers are separated from the dam within six hours of birth. 
And so in addition to discussing CAP health, I will also focus on two additional topics. So this would be individual and social housing of pre weaned calves as an example of how attention is growing in terms of behavioral needs aspects of welfare. And then I'll also touch upon milk feeding practices because these have important implications for calf health, growth performance and abnormal oral behaviors. Outside of the scope of this presentation would be painful routine procedures, for example, which are very relevant to welfare, but not about housing. So in the last 20 years, based on data that have been collected, we have seen significant improvements in calf mortality before weaning. So excluding stillbirths that occur within the first 24 hours after birth, the mortality rates were recently estimated to be about 6% overall, and that's compared to 11% in the late 1990s. And this is in part due to improvements in colostrum management, which has resulted in greater rates of successful passive immunity transfer. So on average, colostrum is fed about three and a half hours after the calves are born. And according to the USDA, larger dairy operations feed colostrum sooner than smaller operations. So on larger farms with over 500 milking cows, colostrum is fed on average two hours after birth. And the highest mortality rates are typically seen within the first two to three weeks of a calf's life across various studies that have reported those values. So the reason that single housing has been the norm in the United States over the last few decades is in part because of this focus on health. So due to concerns about calf mortality and morbidity, social isolation has been seen as a key tool for reducing the risk of calf to calf disease transmission. So by separating the calves and essentially quarantining them from each other for the entire pre-weaning period, this reduces direct contact between calves, as well as their shared aerosol and contamination of shared feeding equipment or bedding. In addition, there are some management advantages that producers have cited. So when calves are housed separately, you can control how much they're fed and monitor individual feeding. And of course, now there has been modern automated technologies that we'll touch upon momentarily. In addition, when calves are housed singly, it is easier to handle them individually for husbandry practices. And so this practice is actually part of the heritage of my own research institution. So here's a page that's taken from a booklet about the history of the Marshfield Agricultural Research Station in Wisconsin. And in the 1960s, researchers were doing work that led to the eventual development of the single calf hutch that's manufactured by Hample Corporation, also known as Calftel, which is about an hour outside of Madison. And interestingly, this company now is interested in pair housing. So we have been collaborating on systems that can promote pair housing. Housing. So the interesting thing to note, though, is despite the attention on health and focus on individual housing as a way to contain disease transmission over the last few decades, we have not seen significant improvements in calf morbidity rates over the same time period, although mortality has fallen. So approximately a third of pre-weaned calves in the U.S. experience illnesses, primarily digestive or respiratory diseases. And other research has shown that social separation of calves is not the only way, nor the best way to maintain calf health. And in addition to this limitation, we now know there are many other welfare benefits to not rearing calves in isolation. In recent years, we've seen interest growing in these other aspects of calf welfare besides health, particularly when it comes to social rearing, which has numerous benefits that's been shown by the research over the last 20 years. So for the sake of time, I won't go into detail, but many of these benefits include um, the calves improved social and cognitive development, as well as their growth performance. And more recently, some evidence that social housing could improve public acceptance of dairy farming practices. In terms of health outcomes in social housing, meaning pairs of groups, the evidence is mixed across different studies. But it's important to note that multiple factors contribute to calf morbidity. And isolation rearing is, again, not the only nor the best solution for promoting good calf health. And many of the same management principles apply for successfully rearing healthy calves, regardless of whether they're housed individually or in social groups. So I won't go into 
detail in any of these management risk factors that have been identified by the research. But I just want to list them here so you can keep them in mind when we go over the housing systems and milk feeding practices that I'll touch upon next. And many farms have been able to successfully raise healthy calves in pairs or groups, while other farms may not quite be ready yet before they transition from individual to social housing. So they might want to take a look at these management practices and make sure everything is in good shape before making the change. So now we'll discuss common housing practices. So in the USDA survey, they reported that 75% of dairy farms, so again, this isn't based on the number of calves, it's based on the number of farms, house their pre wean heifers without full social contact before weaning. So the most common single housing type that they found was outdoor individual housing, which is this light shade of yellow on the right, closely followed by individual indoor housing. And so all of the yellow shades here represent indoor um, sorry, individual housing. They found that less than a quarter of farms use some kind of social housing, but they did not break this down by group sizes or some of the common housing types that we see. So in our survey in 2019, we did ask some more specific questions about social housing. And we found very similar rates of individual housing. So 77% instead of 75% of farms house their calves only individually through the pre-weaning period. And as with the USDA, we found that outdoor individual housing was the single most common system. And that was followed by indoor individual housing. Some farms used a combination of indoor and outdoor individual housing, which is the darker shaded yellow. And then the remainder, which are in shades of green, used either only social housing through the pre weaning period or a combination of some calves being housed individually and some calves being housed in pairs or groups. So we categorize those all as at least some social housing. And of the farms that used at least some social housing for their calves, 61% of them kept calves in groups of two to eight, which we consider smaller groups, and then 39% used groups of more than eight calves. So I just want to show quickly some examples of what outdoor individual housing can look like, because again, this is highly variable across individual farms within and across regions. So individual calf hutches can be made of either plastic or wood. And there are regional differences where these wood hutches are more common out west, for example, in California. And those are shown at the bottom. In terms of the plastic hutches, which are in the top row, calves commonly have some sort of outdoor access. So either they could have a fenced outdoor area as shown on the left, or they could be tethered to the hutches and have outdoor access at the end of the chain. So that's shown on the right. With the wooden hutches, calves do not typically have outdoor access. So the USDA report indicated that on farms that house pre wean heifers in individual outdoor hutches, about 94% provide extra bedding or a windbreak or a combination of these resources during the winter season. And that's regardless of the region or their climate. So there is a change in management in the winter. And now I'd like to show some examples of what typical indoor housing can look like for individually housed calves. So with indoor pens, some individual pens allow limited contact. So not full social contact, but fence line contact between adjacent calves. So that's what you can see in the upper left. Whereas other individual pens have solid panels and these can vary in design. So some of these individual pens now are modular. So they allow for easy removal of the panels between calves to create pairs or small groups. And these modular systems are increasingly being marketed by companies that make either the plastic pens like shown in the upper right, or those that make systems that have metal frames and panels as shown on the bottom. And typically in indoor housing systems, dairy calves are provided bedding, although that's not the norm for veal calves in contrast. And one thing I wanted to note is that indoor housing provides shelter from the elements the for the calves and for the workers, but ventilation is an important risk factor for health issues with indoor housing. In our survey last year, we also asked farmers about the degree of social contact that they allowed for calves that were housed individually. So of these farms using only individual housing, nearly two thirds allow, allow the calves at least visual contact. 
And about 29% allowed some of their calves tactile contact as well, which would be through the fencing panels that divide the pens, as you saw in the previous slide. Very few farms, so about six and a half percent, did not allow any sort of contact, whether that's visual or tactile. So even though the percent of farms that house their calves only individually is still quite high in the US, to me this represents a great opportunity for extension outreach on social rearing of calves. So in my position, I conduct research, but I also do outreach with the dairy industry. And so in our survey, we asked farmers, are you interested in learning more about social housing? So among the farmers who currently house their calves only individually, 36% indicated that they were in fact interested in hearing from us and that they wanted to learn about pair or group housing. So right now where in-person workshops aren't possible anymore, I'm working on a series of educational fact sheets on this topic to help producers make the decision about how to transition successfully to pair group housing, depending on their individual management practices, because there is a lot of diversity and not every farm is quite ready yet. So we're working on giving them information about how to make that call. So within our survey, we also asked about what kinds of housing systems farms are using for social groups. And we found again that the housing styles are very diverse. So there's no single typical strategy for calf housing, and that's especially the case for social housing. So in the next few slides, I'll show all indoor housing and in the green shades, and then outdoor housing is blue. So oftentimes when we say group housing, people make an association with large groups of calves with automatic milk feeding systems. And these types of farms represented about 29% of the farms in our sample who used social housing. But the most common social housing type was actually indoor housing with manual feeding of milk. So 46% of farms total used indoor housing. And these were evenly split between mob feeding, which you can see an example of on the right, where a group of calves shares a milk source. And then the other half used individual manual feeding, and that's shown on the left, where each calf within a group has its own bucket or bottle, such as these nipple buckets that are shown there. And then lastly, about 26% of the farms in our sample did their social housing outdoors. And so this was either by connecting individual hutches using a shared fence, as you can see on the left, or using what we call super hutches, which are intended for group housing of calves. And you can see an example on the right. There's actually a pair of calves in there. You just can't see the second one behind. And just a little more information about this pair hutch systems. This has been explored in several recent studies in the US and Canada, including in my own lab. And this strategy is being deployed at scale in some instances. So my PhD student is from Texas and she visited a calf ranch there who keeps over 600 heifer calves on milk at a given time. And they've been using this strategy now for about two or three years. And this method of combining individual hutches into pairs does have some limitations, but we think that it may be a feasible low barrier or low cost option for farmers who want to keep their existing individual hutches and minimize infrastructure investment while moving to pair housing. So my last point under housing is just a brief note about space allowance. So there are no national standards for space allowance for dairy calves in the US. There was some recent state legislation in California for veal calves. And there are recommendations that are published in educational resources in the industry. And these vary from 30 square feet per calf to 35 or even 40, depending on who's writing it. And one thing to note is that this 30 square feet recommendation already exceeds the typical space allowance that we see in many of these individual calf pens indoors, as well as the indoor portion of calf hutches used outdoors. So in the case of calf hutches, if the calves do have some sort of outdoor access and that space is included, then that exceeds this minimum recommendation. But sometimes that outdoor space shouldn't be considered resting space because in inclement weather, that outdoor area can become wet. So 
I just want to mention milk feeding practices briefly before we wrap up. So one of the questions that the USDA asked farmers was how much milk they were feeding, milk or milk replacer they were feeding to pre-weaned calves. And traditionally in the US industry, there's been an emphasis on an accelerated transition from liquid to solid feeds. So a common industry recommendation has been to feed calves only four quarts, which is 3.8 liters per day. So according to these USDA data, which again were published in 2016, but collected in 2013 and 2014, many farms still routinely underfeed milk. So 56% of farms fed five or fewer quarts per day, which is 4.7 liters. And only 22% of farms were feeding at least eight quarts a day or 7.6 liters. One caveat to note is that the USDA did not indicate the age for this feeding level. So they only said this was before weaning. And they did note that 61% of farms do adjust the milk allowance depending on calf age or calf size. So in our survey, which was collected last year, we specifically phrased the question to ask farmers about the amounts of milk or replacer that they feed to their four week old calves to try to capture the peak of milk feeding. And again, this is in quartz because that's what most farmers think in terms of here. So we're showing the farms that only use single housing in yellow and the farms that use some social housing in green. And what we found was actually that 50% of farms who house their heifers only in individual housing actually feed eight quarts or more. And 66% of the farms that use some social housing also feed at least eight quarts per day. So this is much better than what the USDA had reported. And we know that milk allowance is very important for calf health growth performance, and because greater volumes of milk or milk replacer have been shown by the research to reduce abnormal oral behavior, such as cross-sucking. So in addition to our data being more recent, we also may have captured a different population. So the USDA surveyed farms in 17 states that were considered major dairy producing states, and we were able to capture responses in 30 states, although we know our sample isn't representative of all farms either. So instead, we believe our sample represents farmers who access information digitally and who seek out extension outreach materials, either from universities or industry partners. So it's possible that continuing education plays a role in how much farmers are feeding. So lastly, we also asked about how milk was being fed. So with the USDA, they reported that 77% of all dairy farms use bottles, but also that 72% of all farms use buckets. And that's because many farms use both methods. It's common to have calves start being hand fed from bottles at birth, and then they're switched to buckets soon after. So the USDA data aren't really useful in explaining how calves are fed for the majority of the pre weaning period. So in our survey, we specifically asked how calves were fed for the majority of time before they were weaned. And we found that among the farms that use social housing, which are shown on the right, 80% fed milk or milk replacer through a teat. So this would either be a bottle or a teat bucket or an automatic milk feeder, so that's shown in green. And having a teat provides an outlet for the calves suckling behavior and has been shown to be a practice that reduces cross sucking and other abnormal non-nutritive oral behaviors. For the farms using only individual housing, which are on the left, only 29% fed milk through a teat and the other 71% used either buckets or open troughs for milk. So those are shown in blue. And this means that on these farms, not only do the calves have less social contact, but they also lack appropriate outlets for their highly motivated suckling behavior. So now I'll just summarize the points from my presentation. So first, it's important to emphasize that US farms vary greatly in their herd size and the housing systems they use for their calves. There's no single typical farm type. And individual housing of pre weaned calves remains the norm in the US, in part due to this traditional emphasis on this practice on the basis of promoting good health. However, although pre weaning mortality has decreased over the last couple decades, this has not been the case for morbidity, which still affects approximately a third of all heifer calves. We now have some promising data suggesting that the norm might, might be moving away from restricted milk allowances of four quarts per day. And we have evidence that many farms, especially those who are housing calves in social groups, now feed twice as much, meaning eight quarts per day. But 
The majority of farms feed milk using open buckets or troughs, which do not provide an appropriate outlet for highly motivated suckling behavior. We've also found that interest in social housing is growing with over a third of farmers who currently individually house their calves indicating interest in learning about pair or group housing. And we also saw that farms already using social housing also use other welfare friendly practices such as feeding greater milk allowances and feeding through a nipple. So as my final take home messages, in the last two decades, we have seen some improvements in calf health in the US industry, but many opportunities still remain to improve calf health and welfare, including social, environmental and feeding complexity. Social housing is done only on a minority of farms, but farmers who house calves individually are interested in learning more about social housing, which has many beneficial implications for calf welfare. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for this nice presentation. It's really interesting, I think, and uh, the first questions are coming in, and uh, I think we will answer them in, in our question and answer time at the end of the uh, presentations. So let's move on to our next speaker. That's Julie Foske John Johnson Johnson, sorry, I'm always in the English form. It's not it's, it's Julie is from the Norwegian Institute, a veterinary institute. And in our first webinar, she presented the, the smart calf care project. And that was a really or is still an really innovative approach to cow-calf contact systems in dairy farms with milking robots. But today Julie will talk about uh, the pre-winning management uh, in, of calves in Norway. And I'm looking forward to your presentation. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Can you see the presentation? Everything is in order? I think you should switch over to the presentation mode. I think we are in the speaker's mode on. OK, I see. Sorry. Um, I'll try again. Better? Yes. OK, it's fine. Thanks. I'll take it. <laughs> so thank you so much for the invitation to share our recent research. Um, I work in the research group of animal welfare at the Norwegian Veterinary Institute in Norway. And I'd like to start off today with sharing a belief of mine. Uh, I believe that there's a huge unexploited potential in optimizing the pre-winning calf management, both with and without the cow. And this presentation deals with artificial calf rearing and data from a survey on the pre-weaning calf management conducted among Norwegian dairy farmers. Uh, and in my opinion, the vast amount of research on conventional calf rearing should be acknowledged and also form the basis for systems where cow and calf are allowed contact. Um, it's really interesting to see that uh, the results on the, from the survey by Jennifer, uh, you will see that we have, will have the same interest uh, in our uh, research questions, because um, um, first and worst about the background. So as Jennifer also mentioned, there's a bunch of new knowledge gained by intensive research on the area of calf health management and welfare during the last years, especially from the U University of British Columbia. And as an example, the term calf comfort has been introduced, accompanied by the expectation that calf welfare will be highlighted just as much as cow comfort has been in the spotlight during the last years. So to put it extremely short, the needs of cows have been documented. And consequently, we now need to think differently in the future with respect to how calves are reared. Firstly, restricted milk allowances a calf feeding program that was introduced in the 50s to aid calves transfer from liquid to solid diet as soon as possible. And the research now shows that calves are motivated to drink far more milk than allowed for in restricted milk feeding programs. It also shows that these calves are hungry in performing both vocalizations, unrewarded visits to the feeder and also cross sucking. There's also a huge gap in how these calves grow during the first months of their life and their potential to grow. And in parallel, we'll know, we now know that there are benefits of uh, housing dairy cows socially from an early age, as mentioned by Jennifer. 
The benefits increase with the complexity of the social environment and can be exemplified by improved intake of solid feed, social buffering during weaning, improved cognitive skills, etc. And the UBC researchers have greatly advanced the area of uh, this research. So these findings led us to ask how calves are fed and housed in Norwegian dairy herds. In addition, we wanted to know whether most dairy herds in Norway actually comply with legislation relevant for calf welfare in general and during the pre-weaning period specifically. Minimum standards are stated in Norwegian legislation. As for example, calves should be fed twice daily. Calves should have access to soft and insulated lying spaces and calves can only be housed in single pens for a maximum of eight weeks. Lastly, we also wanted to find out whether there is an association between calf management, compliance to current legislation, and herd dairy calf mortality, a crude indicator of calf welfare at dairy herds. I will now explain how we performed this study. In 2016, veterinary inspectors from the Food Safety Authority in Norway visited 912 dairy herds. These were randomly selected from the population of Norwegian dairy farmers. The focus of the visit was to perform a calf welfare inspection aiming at calves less than six months of age. At herd level, 11 criteria were assessed as satisfactory or not satisfactory. These criteria were, were for example, calf housing, calf feeding, colostrum management, lying space, housing in single pen, etc. And each of the criteria were evaluated based on the minimum standards formulated in current legislation. And all of the visited herds received a questionnaire on pre-weaning calf management. And as you, you will notice, we focus on young dairy calves, exemplified as three-week-old dairy calves. The reason why we chose this age is that we know that calves at this young age cannot yet compensate low milk allowances by other feedstuffs. In this short questionnaire, we asked how much milk was fed to three-week-old dairy calves and how many meals per day. We asked whether and how milk allowance was changed during the recent years. And it was also asked if milk replacer was used and if yes, from what age. Further, we asked if three week old dairy calves had free access to fresh water, yes or no. And lastly, we asked for how many weeks calves were housed in single pens and the barn type. 508 dairy herds responded to the questionnaire, which leaves a respondents rate of 56%. And from the herds that responded to the questionnaire, we collected herd level data on calf mortality and disease treatments for 2016. This data was collected from a central database, the Norwegian Cattle Health Services, where almost all dairy herds participate and share their data. As a result, a data set was formed with all herds that had data from the calf welfare inspection, the questionnaire and the calf management um, questionnaire. And as a result, we found 431 herds that were matched in all three data sources. The two aims of this study were as follows. Um, firstly, to describe housing and feeding of young dairy calves. And I will present the results uh, in detail today. And secondarily, we wanted to investigate associations between calf management, compliance to welfare legislation and calf mortality. And now to the results of the survey. Um, I think I first should mention that the, um, the Norwegian dairy herds are somewhat different from the US dairy herds since our um, herd size is uh, much smaller. So in our uh, population, the uh, mean herd size was around uh, 25 milking um, lactating dairy, dairy cows. So far less uh, herd size. But we found that herds reported that the median daily milk allowance fed to three-week-old dairy calves was seven liters per day. And as you can see on the figure to the right, the distribution shows a highly varying milk allowance. It ranged from less than three liters per day up to ad libitum milk allowances, which was registered as 15 liters per day. Industrial recommendations in Norway now state that young calves should receive eight liters of milk per day at a young age, which corresponds to three week old dairy calves. However, our survey indicates that most herds and 61% reportedly feed less than current industrial recommendation. 
76 hertz and 15% feed less than six liters of milk per day, and 17 hertz and 3% feed less than four liters per day. And although the survey might have missed details on milk feeding levels that might have been higher during other parts of the milk feeding period, we think that we have asked about the most critical period of the calves pre weaning phase. These findings indicate that most of the researched herds, which most likely constitute a representative sample of Norwegian dairy herds, still feed restricted milk allowances to young dairy calves. Recent research showed that calves are motivated to drink around 10 to 12 liters um, of milk per day from nipples, and even more up to 15, 16, and 20 liters when they are suckling their dam. Due to the young age of these calves, they're not capable of compensating a low milk allowance with other feedstuffs as hay and concentrate, even if they are available. And as mentioned before, restricted milk allowances are associated with hunger, low growth, and prevention from performing natural behaviors, and therefore poor welfare. This indicates that there's room for improving the milk feeding management of young dairy calves in Norway. And calves should be fed enough milk to feel satiated uh, at least during the first four weeks. Now, recent research actually indicates that feeding more milk resulting in high growth during the pre-weaning phase actually pays off because average daily gain during the pre-weaning phase explains around 20% of the first lactational yield. Therefore, I think we should go into the discussion whether elevated milk allowance with dairy calves actually should be considered as milk loss or as an investment. Because when provided ad libitum milk in artificial systems, calves will drink as much as they need to cover their nutritional needs. And the pre-weaning phase is the most efficient period of growth um, and with regards to turning uh, their nutrients into growth. So I think that the direct link between pre-weaning growth and production is now established and therefore increased milk allowances may probably be considered more as an investment than a milk loss. And I'd like to encourage a discussion on whether new guidelines should focus on milk satiety, especially during the first weeks of life. And now to the results on milk feeding frequency. The survey indicates that the median milk feeding frequency of three week old dairy calves is three times per day. Most herds and 47% of the herds feed milk twice daily, which is equal to the minimum standard stated in current Norwegian legislation. 56 herds and 12% feed four times per day. And 226 herds and 46% use milk replacer from the age of two weeks. And this indicates that half of the herds feed whole milk to their calves, and they especially use this uh, milk feeding method during the first weeks of the calf's life. Automatic milk feeders is used in 29 herds. And by programming the automatic feeders, milk feeding behaviors can correspond to the ones shown by natural behavior when cow and calf have contact to each other. Because dairy calves suckling the dam spend around an hour suckling per day, and they divide their milk intake on five to 10 meals per day. And allowing for increased meal sizes and more milk, calves seem capable of regulating their milk meals across the day. And um, this recent research from um, uh, Ellingsen and co-authors have investigated the capacity of the calves abomasum uh, to, to, um, for milk. And they found that even in cases of voluntary intake of seven liters a meal, there was no evidence of leakage into the rumen. So it shows that the abomasum has a very large capacity to enlarge uh, with, with milk. And again, these findings indicate that cows safely can be fed bigger milk meals. With regards to housing, we found that cows reportedly were housed in single pens for two weeks only. It ranged from zero to 16 weeks after birth. And as I said previously, in Norway, calves may be housed in single pens for up to the age of eight weeks. So most herds group their calves far earlier than they have to. This is positive due to the benefits that have been revealed uh, by socially housing dairy calves from an early age. Um, 
and uh, it's a very positive signal, um, I think. With regards to water access, 420 herds reported that calves had free access to water at the age of three weeks. However, 82 herds and 16% report that this is not the case. And actually free access to water for dairy calves is actually not mandatory. It's just mandatory in case of high temperatures or illness. And on the basis from feedback from the Norwegian Food Safety Authority, lack of free water access was often seen during the period when cows were housed in single pens, as seen on the picture. In general, in this survey, we found that very few herds did not comply to minimum standards. So we did not find a lot of variation in the measure of uh, compliance to uh, current legislation. And with regards to the results on calf mortality, we found that 25.9% of the herds had no registrations of calf mortality during 2016. And we also found that the median calf mortality rate was 6.4%. And that uh, regards then all cows from zero uh, to six months of age, and also including stillborn calves. Um, we did not find any associations between calf feeding management or whether or not the herds were complying to welfare legislation and calf mortality. However, we did find um, associations between the herds that um, reportedly, reportedly did not allow free access to water at the age of three weeks and calf mortality. So these herds not providing water uh, at this age had higher risk of uh, herd calf mortality. Herds that, that treated calves for diseases also had higher risk for calf mortality. So I'd like to sum up these results. And I think this survey indicates that there is a room for improvement among uh, Norwegian dairy farmers. Uh, we can safely feed more milk to the dairy cows and we can feed uh, fresh uh, water and free access to fresh water. Uh, it's positive to see that most dairy cows are grouped early. There's an abundant use of whole milk uh, among uh, Norwegian um, dairy farmers. And um, it's positive that these cows are grouped at an, at an early age. And we also found an association between uh, calf disease treatments and calf mortality. So uh, we are thinking about whether these um, variables can be used in risk assessment in the future. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, the results from this survey can be found in uh, a study uh, in short time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Julie, so much for your nice presentation and the interesting data on the Norwegian way to rear calves. We move now, last not least, <laughs> to a uh, very, yeah, growing dairy industry, I have to say, to China. And I'm happy that Snorri Zygotsen from the China-Denmark Milk Technology Cooperative uh, Cooperation Center found the time to present the uh, yeah, ways of calf rearing in China today. So the floor. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, well it's uh, two o'clock in the morning here. So, <laughs> so uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to, to share some information with you. I'm going to see if I can share the screen. Uh, you should be seeing my screen now, right? It's fine, yeah. Fine, good. So um, first of all, just a little bit about uh, what, what uh, this CDMTCC is. Uh, uh, you can read about myself there. But uh, this is uh, uh, like an extension service uh, provided by Arla Foods, uh, the dairy company in Europe, and uh, the Chinese dairy company called Mangnu, which is the second biggest in, in China. Uh, and the reason these two companies are working together is because Arla Foods actually has some shares in, in Mangnu. And, uh, and uh, we have been here now for, uh, for 12 years. It's a kind of an extension service uh, where we provide uh, uh, expert knowledge on different management things. Uh, for a young uh, dairy industry as it is uh, basically here in, in China. Um, 
just to give you a little bit uh, heads up about the Chinese uh, situation, because I, I, I reckon that not many have been here or, or even know how the industry is. Um, we have uh, quite young, uh, a reason to build it up, uh, dairy industry in China. So we have uh, new farms with uh, thousands of cows, but uh, we still have, as you see in the average, uh, we don't have access to much data in China, to be honest, uh, but uh, we have some. And the average uh, in 2018 was only 16 cows, so actually, actually lower than, uh, than uh, we, we heard from Norway. Uh, but um, basically the reason for this is that we have a vast amount of farms with only one cow for, for home or, or two cows. Uh, so these are not uh, industry farms or, or selling milk to, to others, but they are considered uh, dairy farms in, in Chinese data. Uh, the company uh, we work for or work mainly with is uh, Magnu. Uh, our average size farms uh, have now close to 1,000 cows, about 960 cows uh, average. Uh, and our milk in volume is uh, somewhere around 6 billion kilos uh, yearly. Um, we have seen a drastic change in the number of farms uh, for the last, in the last decade or, or so, uh, reduced by 75% uh, since 2007. And the yearly production now is about 33 billion kilos, and it's actually growing about 4 to 5% yearly and uh, will continue to grow like that uh, in the years to come based on, uh, on uh, decisions by the authorities here in, in China. This picture is actually quite good. It shows uh, the change that happened in 2007, where you see uh, the big red uh, or brown or, or whatever the color is uh, there on top. Uh, how how uh, uh, the farms with a thousand plus cows are uh, increasing drastically and uh, that is continuing now uh, yearly so we see that the number of farms with less than 100 cows are basically uh, vanishing and the uh, bigger farms are are taking over uh, how is situation in china sometimes uh, i uh, i uh, show this picture because China is actually quite big. It's difficult to, uh, to, uh, to uh, say how it is uh, exactly in all China. As you can see, it's the size of Europe uh, or at least West Europe. But uh, if we look at the farms we are working with, uh, with uh, Mang Niu, uh, that gives you some idea about at least the newer farms uh, and how they are. We have seen uh, a huge, like I said before, a huge change in the dairy farming industry here uh, for the last years. And uh, the last five to seven years uh, uh, has been uh, actually booming in the big, uh, bigger farms, as you see on the pictures here. Uh, on the right top corner, you see a farm which has 15,000 cows in one place. And uh, these drawings were simply copied. So this farming company has now four farms like this. So they have 60,000 cows altogether with four rotaries in each, each farm. Uh, and on the bottom is uh, the biggest farm in China with 20,000 milking cows in one place. So this is the, the environment we are working with. And uh, uh, so it's quite different from uh, many other countries. Uh, because the farms are new, uh, newly built, and, and uh, they are quite, uh, quite fancy, uh, to, to be honest. Uh, some pictures here to give you some idea about the, the farms here. Uh, many of them are, are made by uh, or owned by investors. Uh, it's, they don't have traditional roots in farming, um, which is actually good for, uh, for us working in the extension service because they, uh, they are quite good at listening and they are quite good at following advice because they don't have any roots in this. So they, they are, are uh, following, I'm not saying blindly, but uh, quite well to the advice we are giving the, those farms. Um, yeah, this is inside one of the farms, just to give you some, um, some heads up about um, what to expect if you come over here to visit us someday. Let's talk about the calves. Uh, the facilities are uh, quite uh, different, of course, uh, depending on where the farms are placed in China. Uh, in the north, uh, we see, like in the bottom to the left, uh, isolated farms, uh, closed buildings. And to the right uh, bottom, uh, you see uh, a picture from a farm in the south where, uh, where uh, the farms are very, very much open because the, simply the weather conditions are, are, are quite good. Um, the picture from the left uh, in this area, the, the frost is uh, over 40, uh, minus 40 uh, Celsius uh, when it's coldest in, in the winter time. Um, when we talk about the, the 
Calving, if we start from the scratch, um, most commonly uh, we have some kind of uh, uh, group housing of the small calves in the beginning, uh, uh, like you see in the top left uh, picture there. Um, some of those farms are providing some heating with, uh, with uh, light bulbs or something like that. Uh, but uh, also, like you see in the picture to the, to the right top, uh, uh, we see also see these uh, uh, single uh, uh, hutches or, or, or boxes for, for, the, for the new calves. But uh, my feeling is it's growing that uh, the group uh, facility, like you see in the top left corner, is, is gaining uh, or, or winning. Uh, there is actually quite good management around colostrum, at, at least on the farms we are servicing. Um, they are all using uh, uh, colostrum banks. Uh, uh, I have not visited one that does not uh, carry a colostrum bank and does not measure the quality of colostrum. And again, this is uh, mainly because they uh, they simply follow. Uh, they are quite good here in China to follow rules. Uh, and uh, uh, when when uh, we say what you should do, they simply do it. So that's actually quite uh, quite quite good thing. How they do it and how they store the colostrum, of course, uh, can be different, but um, uh, most of them are doing this in, in, in this way uh, with uh, a, a freezing uh, uh, boxes uh, from Coloquick, which is uh, almost in every farm, not all, but almost every. Um, then uh, regarding the milk feeding period uh, itself, uh, usually they go in uh, and, and, and are in single hutches. Um, like you see some kind of uh, single hutches as you see on the left group housing or pair housing uh, is not common in china not at all uh, um, and it's not gaining any ground uh, we haven't seen any trend in that direction uh, so far um, i think we can say for china it's a little bit like uh, you had in the states where the focus was on is on health and productivity not so much on behavior uh, and, uh, and uh, other things or feelings uh, like you mentioned there. Uh, so here over here, it's quite practical approach to, uh, to dairy housing. Of course, uh, some uh, different, uh, as you can see on the left uh, situation are, uh, are seen, but uh, thankfully they are, are vanishing quite, quite, uh, quite much. And uh, we hope we will uh, see the end of this quite soon. Um, some farms are raising cow calves inside uh, uh, and then uh, it can be in uh, uh, where they are sing singly hand, uh, housed uh, uh, but few not many have some uh, some book uh, calves in in groups uh, but um, this is uh, r more rare than than common uh, to be honest uh, i think these three pictures uh, you see there on the right and in the bottom, uh, I think that's the all three pictures I found in my database and I visited 150 farms out of 600 that uh, we are buying milk from. So uh, I have visited 25% of all the farms uh, we have visited uh, are buying milk from. So, so uh, to be honest, it's, it's, it's not uh, a common thing. But uh, a, a little bit growing uh, trend in, in this direction. Um, at least in the in the advice we are giving, so so uh, we are uh, trying to to push push this agenda somehow. Um, the bedding, uh, different angle from from same farms. Um, we have uh, most uh, most commonly is a sand bedding for the calves uh, and rice shells. Uh, uh, it should be maybe their number two, because those two uh, types of materials are the most commonly used. Uh, but then uh, some of them use straw uh, uh, or timber or, or, or even plastic uh, uh, to stand on uh, or, or rubber, but uh, that's not common. Most common is sand. Uh, I would, if I, I should guess, I would uh, guess 90%. Uh, like I said before, the data is not good in China. So it's a little bit, uh, the, the feeling I have uh, is that the majority uh, are using, using uh, sand and then uh, the rice shells are actually quite good and uh, really comfortable for the calves. The milk feeding methods um, uh, using nipples uh, is not common. Most uh, of the farms are fed uh, from, from buckets. In some cases, they're using milk bars, as you can see on the, the left, on the, on the picture there on, on the right bottom. But uh, uh, 
most uh, common is is buckets, uh, and uh, the use of nipples is is not at all uh, common here. And automatic feeding systems are uh, uh, rare. I think I've seen in one farm uh, on a display, not even in use. Uh, so uh, so uh, I, I I think I can honestly say that aut automatic feeding is is not at all uh, used. However, uh, feed, feeding with uh, acidified milk is actually quite common, and that's growing, um, where the farmers are uh, giving the calves free access to, to, uh, to milk that has been acidified. And uh, um, these uh, systems are something we recommend for the farms. We have been making some recommendations about cleaning and so on, uh, simply because we see the growth of the hypers is, is really good on those farms, usually around 1.05 or even 1.2 uh, or 3 kilos per day for the Holstein hyper, which is quite quite good, at least in, in China. Um, our uh, uh, experience in China is that uh, all farmers are giving uh, some kind of concentrates uh, from the beginning, from uh, early age, uh, they are getting uh, concentrates uh, and that uh, I say it, it's always like that because I've never visited a farm that is not giving concentrates uh, from from almost day one, uh, or access to it at least. However, uh, hay or straw is rarely uh, given to the small calves, so so uh, they are getting those uh, mostly feeds or ca calf mostly or calf concentrates, uh, but uh, not access to uh, to straw or or hay. Um, Ventilation, um, when the calves are, are inside, uh, usually it's uh, uh, overpressure systems, um, but outside, of course, they don't have any ventilation. However, uh, we use uh, cooling uh, quite uh, effectively in, in, in China for the, for the small calves. Uh, and uh, um, that's quite, quite common and quite uh, important because uh, we simply know that the hypers that are cooled uh, simply grow faster. The picture to the right is, are actually from hypers that are not on milk, but that's a different story, but uh, showing a, a, a fans, uh, keeping them a little bit more chilled. In the summertime, uh, it's uh, most common that we use some kind of shades uh, to try to prevent heat stress uh, in the calves. Some kind of uh, fabric is, is uh, put up uh, temporarily over the summertime to, to give them some shade. Uh, and that uh, is basically the, the method we use to, to cool the, or, or reduce their heat stress. And of course, they always get access to water. Uh, that is uh, one of the demands we we make uh, in in Mangnu uh, for our farms that they they give water access to to fresh water uh, from uh, from uh, day three. Uh, we also uh, try to emphasize that uh, uh, protect the feet uh, also from 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 heating up or uh, so so we have all kinds of different solutions out there. This is one example about how you can uh, help the, the feet to, to also be out of the sun uh, and that also uh, keeps the energy level of the concentrate uh, up. We have, uh, like I said, quite practical approach to, uh, to uh, calf uh, management in, in China. Um, we emphasize of use of KPIs um, that the farmers uh, weigh their, those calves, uh, they have to weigh them or, well, they don't have to, but they should weigh them when they're born and when they are weaned. And we have a, a target growth of about 950 grams uh, up to 1050 grams uh, a day. Uh, some are reaching, like I said before, uh, more than that, uh, but of course, some are under 950. Uh, and uh, last week, I actually visited a farmer that has uh, as low as 800 uh, grams per day, which is not uh, uh, satisfying for, for us. Uh, we know that those uh, hyphers will never be, or it will be difficult for them to be good cows. We also uh, uh, keep quite good control on the, K on the uh, immunoglobulin in the, in the colostrum, and our uh, target is over 25, uh, and uh, preferably over 28. And basically, we try to convince the farms and farm managers to, uh, to register uh, quite well. Uh, to be honest, the small calves uh, registration is not good. Uh, they register the numbers and the, 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 the weight, but uh, 
they are not very good at uh, at uh, registering uh, uh, problems like we see on the bottom there uh, regarding mortality or, or or so on. But we uh, have a target of weaning at 55 days, or actually uh, when the hyphers are eating 1.5 kilos of concentrate three days in a row, we basically recommend that the farmers uh, uh, can stop uh, giving them milk. And just to emphasize the, the calf uh, weighing, uh, it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be quite easy to do. And, uh, and uh, uh, we should uh, uh, all, all over the world, uh, recommend our farmers to, to keep quite good control uh, on, uh, of the farm, uh, of the hyphers, how they are growing. Uh, because otherwise we don't know if we're doing a good job or not. Uh, before my previous speech, speakers were talking about um, uh, the milk or volume of milk, uh, um, we uh, we see uh, I've never seen under eight eight liters a day uh, to the hyphers, uh, or usually it's eight up to twelve liters a day, and uh, uh, always uh, milk from the farm. Uh, farmers in China they don't use powdered milk uh, to make uh, to make uh, uh, milk for the calves. So what is the main challenge uh, uh, here in the end uh, in uh, with calf rearing in China, or at least in those farms we are servicing? Uh, we have uh, uh, some lung problems uh, and we have uh, diarrhea, which is uh, like every farmers uh, all, all around the globe are, are, are fighting. But uh, we are trying to um, have some systems to, to prevent this in, in the best way possible, to isolate the sick, cal sick calves and so on if they're not already in isolation. Uh, the heat uh, is uh, is an issue in China and the sun, and uh, um, I think today uh, more or less all farmers are quite well educated on this and uh, are doing some prevention uh, to to try to keep those hyphers uh, as cold as possible. Um, we still have some farms that are not reaching 800 grams a day. Like I said before, I already I visited seven farms last week, and one of them had uh, under 800. So we are still seeing uh, too low daily growth, which is something we need to improve. Uh, and uh, maybe the big issue here is that uh, almost all, if not every farm is using antibiotic milk to, to feed the cows, which is you know, of course something that we don't recommend. But uh, with a, a common, commonly used blanket cow therapy here in China, uh, the, there is a vast m volume of milk uh, that has some traces of antibiotics that uh, the farmers are using. It's always pasteurized. Uh, all the farms are pasteurizing the milk, uh, but uh, it's still a uh, milk that we would not uh, recommend to be used. Just at the end, if you have some uh, interest in uh, learning more about what we have been doing, uh, we have a homepage where we have uh, some reports and, and information on new newsletters and so on. That was very quick about the situation in uh, China. Yeah. Thank you so much, Snorri, for your nice presentation and also that you are very willing to spend your time so late in, in the <laughs> evening to present uh, the data from China. So we still My have uh, nearly 20 minutes left for the question and answer section and I'd like to invite the speakers to switch on their micro and I will go through the um, questions I can see in the chat. and. I think we can start with the with um, Jennifer, but uh, please also the other speakers. Please be, feel free if you have any comments, then just jump in. Um, Jennifer, there was a question from Chris Van Dyke. Uh, you mentioned that the calves are uh, moved on average at day seven, and what's the average minimum? Was the question and the maximum days before calves are moved to rearing facilities? And yeah, is there so a rule? The, the USDA did not report the ranges, so they only reported the means based on the herd size. And so that's where they found that for these large farms with at least 500 milking cows, the average is seven days of age, whereas the smaller facilities actually raise their calves through weaning and then send them off. And so there actually aren't a lot of data and there are no federal regulations. So there's a lot of discussion in the US industry about what should be our transportation guidelines? Because a lot of these pre wean calves that are being sent to these custom growing facilities actually are going on 
the first day of life or within the first three days of life. So even though the average is seven, there are a lot of younger calves. Now, some of these calves are only traveling short distances. So in Wisconsin, for example, some farms will have the calves be born and then they go to a local heifer grower within a few miles just down the road, but then some are sending them, you know, a thousand, two thousand miles. So there's a lot of variation. And again, there's no federal regulations right now. So this is a, a topic of great interest where more research is needed on transportation. And some of that research is happening in Canada. But yes, we, we need much more research to give us better guidelines on this practice, because I think there are some welfare concerns. Yeah. I think so, definitely too. Um, <laughs> Another question, uh, I think it's also for, or is some a part of it is answered by Snorri already, but uh, maybe it's uh, concerns in an American area as well. How do you manage heat stress in hutches, for example, in Texas? Yes, uh, so I'm very glad for that question. It was also very helpful that Snorri showed those slides because this is one of the areas of interest for my own research. So my PhD student who grew up in Texas now moved to Wisconsin. And so we're studying both heat stress and cold stress in pre-weaned calves. So for indoor systems, as he showed, fans have been shown to be helpful. And in outdoor systems, we can kind of translate that where we know the first line of defense is shade. So if we don't block the calves from gaining solar radiation, they'll continue to overheat. So some of these plastic hutches are somewhat translucent and they create a greenhouse effect. So you need to provide shade from either trees or a shade cloth. Some of the hutches are actually opaque. And so we've measured the temperature inside and outside and they don't actually overheat additionally. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is providing natural ventilation. So we don't provide mechanical fans outdoors, but now some of the plastic hutches have kits that you can purchase to modify them. So you cut a hole and there's a window you can close in the winter and open in the summer. So we have some preliminary data showing that actually helps a lot with the calves respiration rates and makes them cooler. Um, and that's even if there are two calves that choose to lay inside the same hutch in the, in the case of pair housing. Um, so that's one strategy. Other producers just raise the hutch on cinder blocks or they build something to elevate it in the summer to allow more airflow, but great question. Yeah, okay. Well, definitely a problem for us too, due to climate change, I have to say. Right. <laughs> um, another thing uh, concerning the hutches, um, pair housing seems a good solution, but what about the cleaning, which seems more difficult for the breeders? breeders? Absol absolutely. So with indoor pair housing, some of the farms have reported labor savings where cleaning a group pen is more efficient than cleaning the individual pens. But then outside, as I alluded to, that is one of the limitations of the pair hutch system. So we like to present that option to producers who are interested in pair housing. And currently they use individual hutches because to them it's a smaller step to now pair the hutches than to invest in purchasing group hutches or to build a barn. But that is one of the problems because the research has shown that even though the calves have one hutch per calf and a shared outdoor area, oftentimes they like to lie together in the same hutch. And so then some producers think, oh, well, then I only need one hutch. And we strongly discourage that we still think it's important to give calves the option to have that space. But yes, it does present a challenge for keeping the bedding clean. And so we collected some data. We haven't had been able to analyze it yet to look at behavior in the winter, especially. We think pair housing can provide undiscovered benefits to help calves thermoregulate, but that could also mean that they're soiling the hutch more. So we're yeah. measuring bedding dry matter. But yes, that's an important concern. Yeah. Another point on um, group housing was, uh, did you have any data about the difference in morbidity when comparing individual or group housing? No, so those data weren't available from that USD mm -hmm. data set. They're just reporting uh, on the whole. But I think that that's an important question because with these custom calf ranches, because they're not a milk harvesting facility, they don't have oversight from the USDA in the way that a dairy farm would. So there's very limited data comparing these types of farms. And so we do have a lot of questions about what are the management practices? What's the range of calf welfare and health, health outcomes on these custom operations? And there are efforts within the industry to try to reach out to these types of farms and provide more guidelines mm -hmm. because the focus has really been on dairy farms and not these dairy calves who are being raised not on dairy farms. So it's a good question, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so, and Nina from Kaiserling asked uh, if you could clarify the definition of stillbirth 
as many uh, my uh, her understanding is that in terms of calf mortality it means that they are were born alive but died before they were 48 hours old yeah so she's right and the definitions do vary so i checked and in the usda they do define it as between birth and 48 hours so actually those mortality rates would be higher if you include between 24 and 48 hours. So what I was thinking of is we have an industry organization here called the Dairy Calf and Heifer Association or DCHA. And so dairy farmers and calf growers are members of this organization that provides educational materials and they actually provide some of these KPIs or benchmarks for calf mortality morbidity and they define stillbirths as between birth and 24 hours. So I, I got those sources confused. Okay. then. Um... Katharina Berger asked if there is any difference in social housing systems between contract rearers uh, versus diaries. Yeah, and again, this is an unknown. So in our survey sample, there weren't as many custom heifer growers. It was mostly dairy farms responding. So we're not really able to distinguish between those in any kind of statistically significant way. But I would suspect that the answer is yes where with these custom heifer growers, because they're bringing in calves from different source farms, there are different implications where you don't want to mix animals from different farms. And I would suspect almost all of those are using individual calf raising. Yeah. And Viviana Apoliaza asked what concentration to consider to evaluate the number of liters that calves have to take. So I think, I think that question was for Julie. <laughs> I think that's... Well, <laughs> Um, did that regard then milk replacer usage then? I would expect so, yes. Yes. Well, I, I wouldn't be uh, the best person to answer because I haven't worked with milk replacer uh, uh, at all, actually. But um, I think uh, that's the reason why many uh, Norwegian dairy farmers actually do not use milk replacer because they think it's, they think it's um, complex to mix it at the right uh, way. And as Snorri also said, um, showing pictures of uh, acidified milk, that's also been used in Norway a lot. And I think that's a, that's a, it's a good compromise, you know, and a good way to feed uh, ad libitum milk to, to the dairy cows. First time I saw it was in Norway, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I've seen uh, in the end of the list was a question also for Snorri about the uh, use of uh, milk replacer in China, why uh, farmers don't use it. So maybe you can explain it. Yeah, just. It's, a good, it's, it's a good question. I think basically it's it's based on because they have uh, uh, enough milk uh, from, from, uh, from the cows. Uh, and uh, also because of uh, there has been some uh, problems to to import uh, powder here, okay. and uh, we are using all the milk we can to sell. There is a deficit of milk in China. Uh, about thirty percent of the dairy products here are imported. Uh, so, so uh, I I think it basically also comes a little bit from that. But but the tradition is also just to use. They 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 don't know. They have never never uh, had this experience with uh, with uh, powder mm -hmm. milk. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, was a question if, uh, I think it's also for all speakers, do you have any information uh, if too low feeding levels in calves results in stress and increased cortisol levels? Do you know about a study about it? Well, I could just, um, you know, uh, the one study that I remember uh, does not look on cortisol, but looks at uh, behavioral indicators of stress. So there are several studies showing that these cows that are fed low milk allowances are vocalizing more and performing more cross-sucking and also paying more unrewarded visits to the milk feeder. Um, but I do not know of any studies looking at um, cortisol levels. Maybe Jennifer uh, or Snorri knows? Not off the top of my head, but I don't know that that would be the appropriate measure unless it was an abrupt change in the milk mm. allowance because with certain measures of cortisol, it's a better measure of acute stress, you know, following dehorning and those kinds of procedures. So I'm not aware of any, which doesn't mean that there aren't. And maybe it's also difficult to differentiate between the housing conditions and also the feeding conditions you know, concerning cortisol levels. Um, then uh, what about the male's mortality rate in dairy herds? That's a question I think to all speakers. <laughs> Um, I just pulled up a study. I was thinking more about the question about the difference in mortality and morbidity between 
dairy farms and custom calf ranches. And I don't, I didn't find a study directly comparing, but I did find one looking at these custom grower operations. And they found that farms that only raised heifers had a median mortality of 3%, whereas farms that raised both heifers and bull calves had a median of 4.5%. And so that would imply that perhaps mortality in bulls is a bit higher and is pulling that average up. So that's just one survey from 37 out of 50 states in the US. Julie, do you have data from, from Norway? Um, no, not from the top of my head uh, right now, I don't. And in our uh, recent study, we did not differentiate between uh, sex. We also only used um, herd level data. Hmm. So I wouldn't, wouldn't know. But in, in Norway, um, I would estimate that half of the farmers rear the bull calves on farm and the half of them sent the bull calves off, off farm for rearing. Mm -hmm. So you do, did you have some data? On no, that? no, we don't, I don't have any data on this, but uh, uh, except the experience is that the, the, the bull calves are, are almost always uh, sold away uh, to, to like uh, special farms, but mm -hmm. uh, we don't, we don't come there because that's not part of uh, dairy, the dairy production anymore in a, in a way. So yeah. I, I, I have no experience on this, sorry. Okay. And likewise, we, we didn't collect those data in our survey. We were focused only on dairy replacement heifers, but again, the practices vary. So some do actually raise bull calves, most sell them, but now there is a shift in strategy to breeding beef dairy crossbreds. And so some farms will raise male calves for a beef market. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's a general discussion, I think, in most of the, the dairy uh, countries now. Um, just to check that one. Um, What's that? Uh, with the very high, high non-response rate, do you think that the responders were the ones that were most interested in calves and there we had higher standards? Yeah, that's, I think it's always a problem with the studies. Yes, inevitably, that's uh, <clears throat> the question. Some some farmers will be ready to, to participate and uh, as Jennifer also mentioned, you know, these are the farmers seeking information and uh, maybe are more, you know, flexible to make these changes. Uh, so that, yes, that's an absolute, uh, it's a good point. Yeah. So, and then something about the water. Um, it was, I think Nina from Kaiserlinger as well. Uh, you, she was a bit shocked that uh, so many farms don't provide water to the calves, so. Yes, uh, we, we were shocked as well and uh, even more shocked uh, to find this association between uh, lack of free water access and uh, dairy herd uh, calf mortality. And so this was an epidemiological and cross-sectional study. So we don't know, you know, the, really the causes here, the causal relationship is not established in this study, but there's something uh, with this measure that probably accounts for other management factors too. But, and I think, like I also saw that someone asked why uh, are so many uh, farmers not feeding uh, water? And I think it comes down to some old myths that uh, have been, uh, you know, alive uh, among uh, dairy farmers, uh, and maybe especially in Norway, I don't know. But there have been two myths, I think, that are, are important here and probably also more. But one of them would be that it's dangerous to feed more than two liters of milk in one meal that's one myth mm. and some farmers also think that it's dangerous to to allow calves free access of water because they can drink so much that they get diarrhea mm. and i've also heard many farmers say that you know if the calves have diarrhea then you should take away both milk and water you know so these myths i i hope that we can uh, slowly start to to kill them <laughs> uh, as long as long, long the pace but um I'm really glad to hear that, uh, for example, in China, you all already have these uh, strict guidelines that all calves should have free access to water. And so we should- It's a, comp it's a company standard here. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. But uh, we are working with the Norwegian Food Safety uh, Authority now, and they are uh, drafting already uh, new legislation. So I'm hoping that it will be in place very soon and that we can prevent calves from not having free access to water in the very near future. Jennifer, what about the US? Do oh, you have a regulation? 
we don't have federal regulations, but we have industry expectations. So the farm program through National Milk, who invited me to speak here, actually, 98% um, of dairy farms participate in this program. And their latest standard is that preweaned calves need access to water by day three. But of course, that compliance is highly variable. And part of it is these myths that Julie alluded to, but it's also some challenges with outdoor housing. So outdoor individual housing is the single most common. And in some regions, the water free in the winter. And so there's questions around, well, how can I show compliance if I offer the water to the calves and it freezes? Does that count as free access or not? How many times per day do I need to replenish it? So there's some practical limitations there where farms may offer water starting from the day of birth, but it's not really free access because it's frozen. Yeah. I can comment on this. This is the same in China. Uh, the, the farms in the north are, are, are course in the winter time they have a challenge on this uh, but they try to 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 do it uh, as well as uh, as they can uh, providing uh, small batches of water uh, four five six times between the milk mills so so but it's it's a challenge for sure uh, when it's freezing of course so then uh, a question for snoria i think it's um what are you basing your evaluation that they need uh, to grow more than 800 grams per day to become good cows I do not believe there is current data supporting this statement since most models linking uh, average daily weight gain, I think, proving to future production cannot model these benefits in the high range of. It's, it's a good it's a good question. So there are basically two, two things. First of all, we're going for uh, we're, we're aiming for uh, uh, our hivers to calf at 22 months. So if we want them to grow fast and be uh, mature, uh, timely, uh, we need them to grow fast from the beginning. So that's one of the reasons. And the second reason is simply we uh, we keep date, date on our farms. Our best farms are uh, producing about 44 to 48 kilos per cow per day. And uh, and these uh, farms have all in common that uh, their, their hivers are growing quite fast. So we are basically uh, using the internal data here uh, to uh, to try to promote a good uh, standard in the industry. It's not based on on on, uh, on scientific research. It's just based on the facts we are gaining here. And we are we are, our best farms are are close to 15 tons average with 6,000 cows, uh, and they are uh, so we're copying the best practice inside China and and uh, spreading it to the other farms. Yeah, and I think the the reason that you provide so much milk to the to the calves or more milk than the other uh, uh, farmers do, then you the result is an increase in the weight gain. That's yeah. normal, I think. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. you will not prevent. That, that's that's how it should be. <laughs> yeah. So and there was another question. Oh, that's what the milk replacer, and then. Um, yeah, also to Snorri, do you use some software or another uh, system to track the calves? I, I wish. Uh, no, we, uh, we, <laughs> we don't have. Uh, and the, the use, uh, general use in China of software on dairy farms is quite limited, uh, unfortunately. The bigger farming companies, there's one big farm company that has about 150,000 cows. Uh, they have some good systems on their farms. And the bigger the farm companies are, uh, the more likely they are to have some, some kind of IT systems. But uh, again, here, everything needs to be in Chinese. Everything needs to be developed here or, or adapted. So it has been taking some time. This is a really young industry. As you saw in the picture, we are basically, uh, since 2007, we have been building up uh, the industry here. So, so uh, everything is still kind of new. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe but, that's one of the reasons the milk replacer is not here yet because it's <laughs> it's still so fresh. The tradition we have in Europe is is not here. Yeah. And then was the question: uh, Is frozen colostrum uh, still preferred a uh, preferred advice, or shouldn't we use something no. different? I, I can tell yes. from from our side, we try to, of course, give uh, always a, a, a fresh colostrum, but uh, we rather want them to to have a frozen colostrum with high quality uh, on stock than than using a bad colostrum or with low immunoglobulin in uh, uh, as as a fresh one, because we have uh, had some issues with calf health, uh, and uh, and uh, that's why we're trying to push the agenda for for uh, for using uh, having a bank with good quality colostrum in. I think we, we are now over the time, but if if you agree and if Maria agrees, then we can we can have uh, the, another five minutes to answer the last questions. I hope. Um, here was one. Uh, 
who was that? Uh, Graham. But most of the talk refers to heavy rearing. What happens to the bull calves? Yeah, that's they are moved to the fattening units, I think. Or so. And um, ah, yeah. when calves are feeding with a bucket without a teat, can you see farms having non nutritive teats to respond to suckling? So we didn't ask that question in our survey, but it is something that we've been encouraging with my extension outreach work that we understand some farms are very committed to bucket feeding, which is not the practice that I would recommend. I would recommend they switch over to teat feeding of milk for a number of reasons. But if they are committed to bucket feeding, yes, we looked at the research and suggested that they provide these non-nutritive dummy teats and another strategy that we recently uh, found with some of the work by one of my master students is there's a device in the US called a Braden bottle. It's actually a bottle for grain and it has a modified teat so that young calves can chew and suck on the teat and obtain some grain. And we found that they use that as a sort of dummy teat and they were also consuming some solids that way. And it wasn't quite as effective at reducing abnormal oral behaviors compared to teat feeding of milk, but I have been suggesting these as alternative strategies if, if producers insist on bucket feeding. That's actually quite interesting. Hmm. Then uh, another, doesn't too much milk makes the transition to solid food harder and lead to proper rumen development? It's always a question that's always coming from farmers, I think. <laughs> Yes, and, and it's a really good good question. Like first, I'd like to just uh, say that in, in Norway, we didn't ask if they use a teat uh, for their uh, during the pre-weaning period or not, because uh, we don't suspect that any farmers are still feeding with open buckets. Uh, but um, um, uh, and what was the second question? Well, only the, the one that uh, if too much milk oh, yes. hinders the transition, yeah. Uh, well, um, uh, there's a lot of new research showing that there are benefits with new um, innovative uh, methods to wean calves when they are on high milk allowances. So more individualized weaning protocols are, are, um, are very good for, you know, allowing this individual um, individual variation, which is really in when the dairy calf starts eating concentrate. Uh, so I think with increased milk allowances, it's important to allow the cows maybe for a longer period for to wean. But I think that research also shows that dairy cows actually start to eat concentrate, you know, at the age of uh, maybe four weeks, they start to eat concentrate. And when they're weaned uh, some weeks later, uh, they actually eat uh, uh, surprisingly high amounts of concentrate, even though they're fed uh, high milk allowances. And and I, I see studies not finding these huge differences in, in uh, daily concentrate intake. And also, uh, so and they're performing very well at weaning, even though uh, they had uh, high milk allowances in the pre-weaning phase. So. Uh, I think yeah, we, sh we, we shouldn't believe uh, that this is a huge uh, problem, but maybe make more um, winning programs that are uh, more individualized. Yeah, but uh, I think if you have only a, a few farms using automatic feeding systems it's, uh, or uh, milk feeding systems, it's difficult to, to keep the track on the milk intake and the, and the concentrate intake, isn't it? <laughs> But I think also the what is considered a high milk allowance is relative, right? That's changed. Our perspective has changed over the last few decades where we still have this lingering advice to feed only four quarts. But now we know that there are a lot of negative welfare implications for doing so. And so seconding what Julie said, yes, the research shows that calves fed higher milk allowances, however you define that will need to be weaned a little bit later, but they do end up catching up and consuming solids. And so I think that there are ways to manage that quite successfully. And calves that are fed high milk allowances do start consuming solids even in the first week of life. It just takes longer for them to reach that same peak and hit those targets for how much you want them to consume before they're ready to wean. Yeah. But again, coming from a welfare perspective, we think that the benefits outweigh any of those potential limitations, which we can overcome. Completely agree with you. Um, there is a point 
going in the same direction. Do you have uh, recommendations about the longer of hay stray, uh, hay and straw farmers should give to calves to help rumen development and reduce abnormal behaviors? Do you know about studies concerning the hay consume, consumption? Yeah, there are recent studies showing that hay provision can reduce abnormal oral behaviors. In Canada, I think it's a bit more common than in the US if we're thinking about North America. So the USDA collected data about the average age at which calves are provided hay and it's close to or after the time of weaning. It was something like 40 days, but they didn't ask when it was first provided um, and and how many farms actually were doing it. They only reported the average. So it, it's really atypical here, but sometimes there is, you know, chopped roughage in the concentrate or starter mix, but mm. it, it's not typical, even though, yes, research has shown there are potential wel welfare benefits. It's um, even further behind common practice, I would say, than increasing the milk allowances or social housing. Yeah, well, I actually wish that I did ask uh, our dairy farmers when they start to, to feed hay because uh, that's actually something that is uh, stated in current legislation that calves should have access to hay. So that's a huge, you know, uh, mismatch there. We, they should have access to hay, which I don't, uh, like I really know that it's important, but they should also have access to water. So current legislation should emphasize both access to hay and, and water and they are both very important for the development of the rumen. And I see that dairy cows, you know, it's interesting to see how young they are when they start, you know, chewing hay and they do some kind of rumination, although it's, uh, it's different than uh, the adult cow, but uh, yeah, providing access is uh, hugely important, both hay and also concentrate, I think. Yeah, I think there is still a lot to do in education and also in getting data from the farmers. So I really enjoyed this webinar today and I'd like to thank again uh, all our speakers for these really good presentations and interesting studies they showed us today. And I'd like to thank uh, Maria for her support before, during and also after the webinar, I can say. And I'd like to thank all of you uh, for listening today. And I hope I can, or I'm looking forward, I hope I think we, we will meet again. Um, I'm looking forward to, to welcome you at our next webinar. And I think it would be held in, at the beginning of next year. So please uh, stay in contact and have a look for our course for the webinars. So thank you so much and have a nice day, have a nice night or <laughs> have a nice evening wherever you are. Yeah, so goodbye. You too. Thank you very much. Thank you Bye. very much.